John Martinez. I'm the chairman of the National Hispanic Construction Association. We are pleased today that you're joining us for staying financially healthy during the coronavirus pandemic. This is a uh, seminar brought to you by the chapter in the DC metro area, and you will meet their uh, executive director, Jose Suero, shortly. We also have two excellent representatives from Cone Resnick, and we have Luisa Moreno with the National Hispanic Construction Association um, to help us this morning. Before we get started, I wanted to make sure that um, if you get logged out, please make sure to log right back in using your link. Your link is just an individual link to yourself. So uh, I know sometimes it happens very rarely, but your Wi-Fi um, has some, some shortages and you'll have to log back in. But there also is a phone option that came in through your email that came out an hour before the webinar started. Please stay for the whole webinar. There's always some excellent Q&A at the end. And I think that's where people really hear the interpretation of the pres presentation by other speakers. We will have two short polls uh, when we present those, if you can just answer those, and that helps us um, helps us get to know a little bit about you and about what's going on. So we just launched a poll that will help the help us know a little bit of background information about the uh, attendees. And then you will also see a Q&A button and a window and a chat button in the window. And the way we use it is the Q&A window are the questions that we will ask our presenters. And the chat button, that window is sometimes some of the attendees want to have a discussion or have some questions among each other. We will respond to questions in the Q&A uh, window. And then at the end of all this, about an hour and a half after the webinar, we will send you an email and the email will have a link to the webinar video in case you want to rewatch it or forward it. And it will also have the presentation in a PDF format so that you'll be able to open that easily. Uh, and with that, we've launched the poll. We can see here that 36% of you are actually the owners of construction companies. 68% um, of you are feeling optimistic about construction in the rest of the 2020. And 36% of you have applied but have not received the uh, SBA disaster loan or paycheck protection program loan. 29% of you have applied and received it, which is pretty good average. Um, some states they've had as low as five or 6% have received it. And then 36% of the people responding to this poll have not, um, have not applied for the SBA disaster uh, paycheck protection plan. So I hope that's a little information that are good for Jack and Mary. And with that, I'd like to present to you the mastermind of getting this uh, presentation going for us today, Mr. Jose Suero with the DC Metro Hispanic Contractors Association. Thank you, John. And thank you, National Hispanic Construction Association for the wonderful job they're doing. We're very pleased and proud to be presenting this webinar. Uh, I, my name is Jose Suedo. I'm the managing director of Metro DC Hispanic Contractors Association. We're one of the sponsors of this webinar. And I'd like to introduce you to our main speakers today. One is uh, Jack Callahan, who's a CPA and national construction industry leader at Cone Resnick LLP. Jack will lead discussions on some best practices to guide our contractors through these challenging times. We'll also be joined by Mary Amato, who is a CPA and is a tax partner specializing in construction and real estate. Mary will discuss the CARES Act provisions that modified the tax code, the tax code that could provide some cash flow relief. We're very honored and pleased to have Cone Resnick LLP uh, provide these experts to us today. Cone Resnick LLP is a national and global expert company in advisory, accounting, and assurance tax. Audit assurance and tax services are fundamental to your business. They prepare you to act on opportunity, manage risk, and maintain compliance. A strong advisory partner adds intellectual bench strength to your team. 
Cone Resnick will help you address every circumstance with discrete services or holistic integrated solutions. With that, on to you, Mr. Callahan. Jose, thank you so much. And John and Luisa, thank you for making this uh, making us uh, possible today. And we're really honored to have a chance to address your membership and to be part of your organization. I've been proud to, to, be, to be members and, and to be part of your team for a number of years now. And so these are unprecedented times we're facing. We've got challenges that none of us thought about. Going into the beginning of the year in January or in February, I was presenting about the strong tailwinds that we had, how well the markets were doing, how our contractors had tremendous amount of backlog, and things really looked strong. We cautioned, as we always do, about the potential for, um, for the black swan that might be out there, and, and none of us ever thought that the black swan would be this coronavirus. It hit, it hit with a fury and a vengeance in March, and it just continues on to today. And none of us, as we sit here today, can really determine when, the, when if, if there is a change. And, but one thing we do know, it's everything's been different, and it will be different for quite some time, and potentially for longer. Um, we're going to have to face these challenges face on. And you and your, the Hispanic contracted community, I, I'm assuming, are going to be especially hard hit. You've taken a long time to build up your net worth, to build the backlog, to build the relationship with owners. And now there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Now, fortunately, um, with the construction industry, it's been deemed to be essential services at certain levels. So some of your jobs, I'm sure, continue to go on, but there are certainly other jobs that have fallen, that have been put on hold or have gotten sidetracked. And, and really, there's a lot of uncertainty as to the future as to where we're going to go. So Luisa, if the next page is kind of the firm disclaimer that we put out there that sort of indicates that, you know, everything we're giving you since this pandemic has hit, and the CARES Act got started. We've been flying fast and furious trying to gather information, trying to make disseminate information to the field that our clients need and our prospects and the community that we work in need the information. But we're passing on information based on really best guess at, at this point in time. The legislation has not been passed. The rules and regulations haven't been passed. So please, you know, Work with your, and I always say for a contractor to succeed, he has to have that core team of trusted advisors. He needs to have an attorney. He needs to have an insurance agent. He needs an accountant. He needs a banker. And he needs a trade organization behind him that can provide the information and the impetus to help them survive. You've got to let, rely on that core team of trusted advisors now and take information of all of them to make your best informed judgments. So if we move on to the next slide. <laughs> We're going to talk, the cash is king. It's always been in this business and always will be. And there are new challenges today around the cash issues that we want to talk about. The CARES tax provisions are specific. We were talking with our Washington, D.C. lobbyist, and what was pretty amazing, and I just couldn't even imagine it, but Congress approved and authorized more spending in the month of between March 15th and April 23rd than they had in the prior eight years that they've been in session. So think about the magnitude of that. And all this spending and all this authorization of spending has been done with very little guidance and very rules and regulations and all uncharted territory. So you have to react and you have to, to, to work in that environment. And we've been giving guidance on these various, these PPP loans. And you know we presented yesterday because there's a deadline of tomorrow, May 7th for, for certain provisions. And then last night at six o'clock, they pushed that back to another week. So that's how fluid this is. That's how quickly these things are changing. But we'll walk through some of the CARES Act provisions. There are some tax return issues that can potentially give you cash flow. And we want to be able to, to, to relay and share with you some of the thoughts on that. And then some of the basic business practices of where you are. I'm not an attorney, but we certainly can talk about the contract languages and things that you have to work for. And you know, certainly nothing more, I assume, concerning in the D.C. market space among a lot of contractors is you know, what did yesterday's announcement that the Purple Line contractors were going to get the job back? And, you know, how is that going to impact your day-to-day? -day? What is the contractual provisions? What do they provide for for you as a subcontractor looking to that major contract? So it's the same with, with these force majeure and some of these other clauses that we're, we're hearing about jobs being shut down as a result of the pandemic. So that'll give you an overview. But really what we want to do is try and cover a lot of this very quickly because really we're here to be as a resource to you. So we want to open it up for discussions and questions and answers. 
and then make ourselves available through your association. Whatever we can't get to today, we'll be able to, to relay later on. And John has indicated there's a chat button at the bottom of your screen. So if you have questions, by all means, um, type those questions in and then John will try and Jose will try and keep an eye on those and, um, and relay the questions to us and we'll try and answer them. So if we go to the next, the cash is king. You know, you need it if you haven't managed your business with cash flows and cash flow budgeting and forecasting, you have to do that now. Talk to your accountants, talk to your bankers, see if you can get economic models to do the cash flows because it is going to be critical. You know, we don't know what's going to happen about getting payments, requ requisitions getting out, our approvals going to get through, our submissions going to get, you know, are the owners going to be able to, to authorize things on time? So you have to look at all where you are, really track more than ever your cash flow needs and demands and make sure that you're working with your, your prime contractors or your owners to make sure that they understand your position and your inability to carry this burden. What I wanted to touch base on, and, and two of them are, well, actually the three here are gonna be real important and it was very promising to see the numbers on the PPP loans. So the Paycheck Protection Plan loans are a tremendous vehicle and for contractors that are working, they can be an incredibly powerful vehicle. They allow you to borrow money, effectively borrow two and a half time, two and a half months worth of payroll costs, you'll be able to borrow. And then you'll have an eight week period from the date you get funded until, the, until eight weeks after that in order to spend those dollars for a certain approved and designated expenses that you can pay them for. And the real power of the PPP loans is the ability to get those loans forgiven. Most of you won't have any issues. You'll fit under all the small business administration guidelines, but there were provisions that sort of bypassed those and allowed every contractor with less than 500 employees to get on board. So it became very powerful. Construction is an industry, and maybe not so surprising on that, the poll that was taken earlier, 14% of the total overall allocation to industries was to construction, which was the largest, which makes sense because so many of you women and men have heavily labor intensive businesses, machinery and, you know, and equipment intensive businesses. So it made sense that you could qualify for a substantial amount of these dollars as a result of it. So they're out there. Those are unsecured loans of 1%. If you haven't taken advantage of them yet, reach out through the association, reach out through your local um, economic development agency, find some of the smaller banks, some of the smaller lending institutions that can work with you. The big banks, forget it, they were overwhelmed. They couldn't process what they had, but there are still some smaller lenders and some smaller facilities that are available to the minority contracting community that can help you to facilitate those loans. There's some left, if you can get them, get in on the second tranche because they can be very powerful to help you out and get you through some of these, these cash flow crunches. A lot of the discussions have been that the wrong people got the loans, Harvard, Yale, Shake Shack, and others. So there was guidance put in that you had to be able to show the economic need for these dollars. I'm suspecting that most of the members of this organization will be able to show the economic need, given all the uncertainty that's coming out as a result of the contracts going on right now. These, these traditional small business loans are called the EIDLs, the Economic Impact Loans. Now, if you apply for that loan, and even if you don't get the loan, you can still get a $10,000 grant it's just by filling out the application. So for some of the smaller contractors, $10,000 could mean covering next week's pay or getting you through a tough time right now, covering some overhead for you. So take a look at the, it's sba.gov. We can provide all the links later on but it's simple enough, sba.gov backslash disaster, the EIDL loans. And again, just by going through the process of filling out the application, you can get $10,000, which is a grant. It's not, re it's not returnable, it's not refundable. But the other loans are available to you. Um, they're easier for the bank to underwrite. And I know a lot of the, you know, the members of this organization have trouble through traditional banking facilities and trying to get credit. This may be an opportunity for you to get some credit. You can do both a PP loan and an EIDL loan, so take a look. And then I'm not thinking the Main Street, that's for the bigger companies, and, and a few of you hopefully are in that role. And uh, if you want to discuss those, again, reach out, and we'll talk about them. But besides those are the three federal programs, there's numerous state grants and loans that are out there, and you want to make sure, again, that you find out locally in your states and your communities. Again, most of those got fully subscribed, and there's not a lot available. 
but you have to keep an eye and ear on what's out there in the communities to see if you can access any of the local state grants that might be available. If we go on to the next slide. So that's kind of the, the immediacy. Look to your contracts, look to the cash flow needs that you have right now. Take a real hard look at what your overhead is, how you can control your costs, and then look to see what you can do to tap some of the access. And these are the specific loans and, and direct cash flows that have come out. But additionally, there are a couple of other acts inside the CARES Act provision that both affect the income tax returns and some deferrals that are out there. And I'll ask Mary to touch on those briefly. Hi, good morning, everyone. So there are actually two laws issued in a short period of time. The first is the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And that is the provisions that provided for uh, family, medical, and sick leave. So if you find yourself um, experiencing a situation where you either, either had a employee who was affected by a self-quarantine requirement or actually um, sick themselves or needing to stay home for a child under 18 uh, and to care for that, that child, there are certain wages that could be paid under the Family Leave and Sick Pay Act, which would be exempt from the 6.2% employer share of Social Security withholding. So that would help reduce payroll tax deposit requirements. And to the extent you were paying wages under these provisions, you would be able to take a credit against your overall payroll tax deposit for your complete workforce. So even a, the workforce, the deposit attributable to the workforce that is not affected, you could still take the wages paid to those under the Medical and Sick Leave Act and reduce your payroll tax deposit requirements. There's a little complexity, probably too much for, for this um, short time we have together. So that's just something to bear in mind if you're experiencing paying any kind of wages to employees for the period of time they're away from work, uh, you should look into this uh, credit against the payroll taxes. Uh, in addition to that, um, there is a employer tax credit, which would be for the amount of paid sick leave to these people. And that again is reduced against the entire uh, payroll tax deposit. Under the CARES Act provision, there's a couple of things that are also non-cash. And these two have to be looked at in conjunction with any loans that you may have benefited from. The first is a, a similar, a payroll tax deferral. And this is a payment deferral, which allows you to, again, defer the Social Security portion of the payroll tax deposit for a period of two years. So whatever you defer is then payable half at the end of December of 2021 and half at December 2022. So for any uh, payroll tax deposits required from March of 2020 to the end of the year, uh, this deferral again is available. So what it does is it gives you availability of that cash that you otherwise would have to be paying for payroll tax deposits. And it doesn't sound like a lot because it's only the 6.2% of um, Social Security tax, but depending on the number of employees, it could add up. And it is, you know, for this whole period for the remaining part of this year, and it gets to be deferred for two years. The next is uh, the employee retention credit. Now, this employee retention credit um, is not available to the extent you have a paycheck protection loan that's forgiven. Um, the, the payroll tax deposit deferral I first spoke about it is not available at all, even if you don't get your loan forgiven. So any loan participation would knock you out of the box for the payroll tax deferral. But for the employee retention credit, this allows those employers with um, employees who are working or not working during this period, a credit of up to $5,000 per employee for wages paid um, during a period of partial or full shutdown. So that leaves a lot for interpretation. And again, I think the nuances of how it applies to each employer is probably a, a little too deep for the time we have here. But the two distinctions are whether or not you have more or less than 100 employees. So if you have greater than 100 employees, the wages paid to any 
employee are only eligible for the time when they're not providing services. So then the discussions go into, well, what does that really mean if someone is working a four-day week compared to a five-day week and they're still um, getting full pay, then maybe they're getting paid 20% of the time for time that they're not working. So things like that you should keep in mind because there could be this availability of a, a $5,000 per person uh, credit. Uh, Jack, if you could go to the next slide. Okay. Um, the changes in the law, oh, too far, back to the tax return issues. There you go. So the changes in the law, besides providing for uh, these specific things, specific to the coronavirus and for employees and affected people, it also went back and kind of revisited a lot of what was put in place in 2018 with the Tax Cuts and Job Act. So to that extent, the provisions for net operating losses were amended. Um, and the, I don't know, a lot of you with flow through businesses might have been surprised in 2018 by the haircuts on the losses that you were able to really benefit from, from operating businesses. They've removed uh, that restriction. And the other thing that they addressed was the life of qualified improvement property, which previously was being strung out over a, a life of a real property, and now they reduced that life to 15 years. So what this really puts in front of you is, is a, a huge planning opportunity that needs to be looked at you know, in detail. It's, it's multifaceted. And, and what it's allowing is losses that may have been generated in 2018, 19, and 20 can now be carried back five years. And if you remember, the law in 2018 took away the ability to carry back, and there was only a carry forward. So now, with this ability to carry back five years, if you look back, you might be carrying back to a year where you had a substantially higher tax rate, because the 2018 law reduced tax rates, especially for corporations, but, but also for individuals. So in making that analysis, you also have to bear in mind all the historical thought process that, you know, if you forego the carry back, you have this NOL available to you to carry forward in future years. But if you carry it back, you might be going back to a higher tax, year, tax rate year. So you might have a dollar for dollar better bang for your buck in the amount of a refund. If you file for an expedited refund, that money gets issued within 90 days generally. Um, and then it's like a, you know, a, a pay and, and look at later. Uh, whereas if you amend returns, uh, they could audit you first and then issue the refund. So that's a decision that also has to be made. When you look back to the years that you're carrying back, do you have any complexities in the year? Were there any kind of business acquisitions, dispositions, or anything in the return that might outweigh the cost benefit of carrying back to those years and, and requesting the refund. In determining those losses that are available to carry back, you also might be surprised that because of the effects in 2018 of what we refer to as the excess loss adjustment, which was the haircut on the flow through businesses where losses were capped at $500,000, that cap has been removed. The NOL cap that only allowed you to offset 80% of your income with losses rather than 100% has been removed. And in addition to that, the qualified improvement property that was given an extended life is now reduced to 15 years, which would accelerate the depreciation, would also allow it to be available for bonus depreciation, which is 100% write-off in that initial year. So all of those things pieced together might make your 2018 return look much different than it was as filed with a larger loss that could possibly go back to 2013 and recoup dollars that were paid at a higher tax rate. So there's a lot of complexities, but it, it really is worth the legwork. Filing for the expedited refund is, is a short form that, although it's a short form, there's a lot to go into preparing it. And if it's filed by, um, well, it's required to be filed by June 30th. 
If you don't meet the June 30th deadline, you still have the availability to look into these losses, but you'd have to do it through an amended return. So that would be an amended return, not only for 2018, but for the years you carry back. So it could be to 13, 14. So you could be looking at five years of amended returns. So it's something to focus on, I think, this month and to see if you have any opportunities. But um, it, it's, a, it's a really big advantage for, for many people. So those are the things that relate to the tax return issues that are now available from these new rules as they apply to losses and to depreciable property. In conjunction with that, um, I don't know if some of you are familiar with the real property trader business election under section 163J, construction um, falling within the definition of a real property trader business. And that was the election that was made to possibly um, not take a haircut on your interest expense, but you were giving up certain depreciation rights. And with the qualified improvement property being strung out over a long year, that really maybe didn't matter. A lot of people made that election, um, but it's, it's something to revisit because if you could get the bonus depreciation on the qualified improvement property, you might wanna revoke that election. So all of these things really bring you back to your 2018 return, which would need to be amended, elections changed, and different accounting methods put in place, and then you could go forward with a clean slate. Once we look at all of those issues that have been provided for losses, you also want to think about those of you who are participating in the Paycheck Protection Program and have loans that have been funded. When, once those loans are funded, your next Big, biggest challenge is to make sure you maximize the amount that could be forgiven. So in doing that, you're going to need to look at all of the eligible expenses, what you spend in that eight-week period, and most of all, how you categorize that. When the eight-week period comes up, you basically have to go to the bank and ask for forgiveness. And that's almost like saying, please audit me. So you want to have a nice package of everything that was paid, and where you posted it in your general ledger, how you paid for it, and what those amounts represented. So it brings on another level of accounting where you might wanna be tracking these accounts as COVID expenses, just so you can identify and distinguish between what you counted towards eligible expenses and which you didn't, so that you're not really opening your entire books and records for them to fish through and try to figure it out. You wanna really track that from day one, from your first spend, to make sure you have a proper accounting of all those eligible expenses. I guess you notice I could go on forever. There's a lot in these acts, but based on our time, as we're gonna continue on, and so we'll have time for questions at the end. Great, thanks, Mary. John has corrected me that the, the button down bottom, the Q&A is where we'll put the questions, not in the chat box. So please use the Q&A session uh, for the questions. We've got some coming in and we'll get to those right away. So real quickly, again, you know, Look at your subcontract agreements. Look to your prime contractors. Make sure you understand what your contract terms are. If jobs have been suspended, if jobs have been delayed, every one of you has a change of work conditions. You know, you now have social distancing. You now have cleaning stations. You have a lot of additional um, PPE that you've got to provide for your workers. Make sure you're working openly and actively and work now while everybody's in this together, while there's a feeling of mutual support it's gonna be a whole lot easier than you try and go back and look at it later on. Um, see what your delay clauses are. And again, if there's force majeure clauses in there, which allows people to close a contract down because of these unknown circumstances that are beyond anybody's controls, what are your remedies and ramifications? So as I say, now is the time for you to get together with your core team of trusted advisors and go through all the different concerns and the challenges that you're gonna to face to make sure that you're prepared to deal with those because they're gonna be significant. And I challenge every one of you that now everybody's feeling the pain. And if you can get some cooperation, it's gonna be now. When things get better and everything gets back up on track, people are gonna be less receptive to going back and revisiting these challenges. They went through them themselves. They didn't win out on all of them. They're gonna maybe look to take some of that back out on, on you and, and be, like I said, not as, as agreeable to coming up with the settlement amounts. So we go to the next and the last slide and then we'll go right through the Q and A. Um, so some of the practical considerations, you know, Mary talked about setting up a separate account for the PPE, tracking that, because again, if you're over $2 million 
in those loans they're telling you you're going to get audited but even on below two million you know certain there's really likelihood somebody's going to look at this so if you have one account that you can give them to audit i think you're going to be a lot better off with from cash flow perspectives look at your insurance premiums there is the ability built into a lot of the insurance regulations by states right now to allow you a 60-day grace period on paying the insurance premiums Take a look at that, but at the same time, you have to balance that against your PPP loans. If you've got a PPP loan and you have the ability to potentially forgive some of those expenses, you may not want to defer those payments right now. If as a result of this, you've had a substantial short, you know, shortfall in your volume and you know you're going to have less workers comp, you're going to have less labor force because of, of shutdowns and layoffs that you had to make, look at doing you know, earlier audits of your workers comp policies, again, to potentially get refunds there. So managing your overhead and then looking at your technology you know you have owners right now who are working remotely you're good employee more and more of your employees are working remotely so take a look if you didn't make the technology investments you know how coming out of this can you align yourself to make the effective um, technology advancements on your accounts receivable talk to your owners i mean you know a lot of the minority set aside programs that many of you are participating benefiting from there are requirements that they've got to pay you get the seven days um, payment terms. Make sure that you remind them of that, that you go to them and understand that, you know, you don't have the, the deep pockets and you can't carry all this burden yourself. If there's going to be slowdowns, they have to keep you posted. And again, there's some strength in numbers and there's strength in being proactive and being known and seen as a subcontractor that they need to complete the jobs and to meet their goals. And then on the flip side with your vendors, you know, open, active discussions and holding to the commitments. We know there can be some cash flow burdens here, but if you're upfront and you're honest about the negotiations, you're going to have a much better uh, opportunity to be successful in managing through these difficult times and through these difficult cash flows. So uh, at that, John, let's get right to the questions, and I'm sure then we'll have a chance to get into some of these strategies and things more by way of answers to the Q&A. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Jack and Mary. Uh, first question is, my paperwork says I have to deduct the 10000 I received from IEDL from Paycheck Protection Program loan. Is this correct? Yes, because you, you can't, because you're going to, well, if it's, if you get the PPP forgiven, then you can't be taking the $10,000 as well. So that would be a doubling up on those two loans. Okay, thank you. I appreciate going through these bullet points. Please tell me how I can have all the bullet points in, in detail. So at the end of this, uh, I'll answer this one, Jack. At the end of this, in about an hour and a half, we will send out this presentation in PDF, as well as the webinar video that you can watch. And if you're like me, I've, I've become king of YouTube. Sometimes I gotta watch those several times to get that point. Um, but we will have those available for everyone. Our next question is, there was a first round of COVID disaster relief grants offered by local municipal governments. Washington DC, Maryland, Montgomery, and PG County are now, and now Virginia. I encourage entrepreneurs to not only apply at the federal level, but explore the local as well. And I think there was that was also explained um, or we touched upon it in one of the slides. I know that throughout the country, as we talk to different chapters, there's different programs within the city, counties, and states, and other jurisdiction. I will echo what Jack said in that um, you can't double dip. So what I mean by that is, if you use, if you get multiple loans, you can't, you can't have the backup be the spend that you have for multiple. They will check on that. As, as far as everyone that I've been able to see, if you're saying that this 11,000 is what you used the PPP loan for, you can't tell your local jurisdiction that same 11,000 um, was the backup for whatever loan or grant that you got from them locally. So the good news is there's a lot of opportunities out there. Um, but you are going to have to follow this because post the pandemic, people will go through these things with a fine tooth comb. Jack or Mary, did you want to add something to that? 
No, I think that's the key is, is, is you have to be, and that's why your organization is so powerful. Use your trade groups to make sure you know what's available there locally. And yes, you're not going to be able to, to pile on and use the same dollars for the same expenses. Okay, so. Thank you. Uh, another question here. Uh, it was mentioned uh, the 2013 tax returns and amended 2013 tax returns. Can I call you on this for clarification? Well, Mary, do you have any clarification here? Because we're recommending that um, people really reach out to their local professionals that they use in their trusted circle. But uh, uh, Mary, did you want to touch on this? Yes, I, I'll try to clarify. So I guess what I was emphasizing is there's changes that affect the 2018 return. The 2018 return would most likely need to be amended. And to the extent that loss is larger than you originally anticipated, that would be the reason for amending it if you have a substantial impact to the 2018 return, then you could carry back the NOL. If you carry back the NOL through the expedited procedures, which would be by filing an 1139 or a 1045, that's just a, an NOL carry back refund claim form. And that would need to be completed by June 30th. If you miss that opportunity and you can't get it done by June 30th, then that's when you would need to go back and amend the returns to the extent you would be amending them would only to be to claim the relevant loss that's carried back. So for example, if you had a 2018 loss and you wanted to carry it back to 2013 and you did not do that with the expedited procedures by June 30th, you wouldn't have missed out. You'd be able to amend the 13 return after June 30th. Thank you, Mary. Our next question is receive 2.5 times payroll. Do we only have the eight weeks to use? What happens to 0.5 left over? Will that be forgiven or owed back? Great. Yeah, great question. So they understand they're taking the average payrolls for two and a half months, but they're giving you eight months to spend it. There are other allowable expenses that and forgivable expenses, and those are rent, or if you own your own place, it'd be the interest on the mortgage that you're paying on that. Those are allowable expenses to be paid and available for forgiveness. You've got your some of your insurances and your benefits, so those are going to go in. You'll have certain utility expenses that will be able to be paid and deducted and taken as a forgiveness. So the idea was two and a half times and then two, the two months was the basis foundation for the core of those expenses, which would be labor. But there are, and it kind of goes into the next question, is there a list of the acceptable expenses? Those other acceptable expenses, again, those are gonna be rent. Those are going to be um, interest on your equipment notes, not the principal payments on your equipment notes, but the interest on your, uh, equipment notes. If you have an existing line of credit facility in place, the interest on that can be for those two months for that eight week period can be taken as a deduction. So it's going to get very specific on incurred and paid in that eight weeks. So you really have to watch, you know, you can't prepay a lot of expenses. You can't prepay six months worth of rent. So it can only be incurred and paid in that eight week period. So that's why you've got that extra 0.5%. It's to cover these other expenses. And again, so Mary, maybe you can fill in what, what I'm missing on the except of all their expenses, but it's going to be rent, it's going to be certain interest expenses, it's going to be utilities. Are there other specific yeah. factors in the expenses? No, so it's really, it, it's the, the payroll costs, including the health insurance, it's the uh, interest, as Jack said, on different types of loans, uh, rent, and then utilities. And utilities is the umbrella that, what do you have in there? Gas, electric, internet, telephone, cell phone, gas for vehicles. So um, it's, it's a lot of those expenses. And then in going through, crunching through the calculation for the potential forgiveness, there's a cap that those other expenses can't be more than 25% of the amount forgiven. So basically they're saying, you know, the thrust of the forgiveness is gonna be driven by the payroll incurred in those eight weeks. Thank you, Jack and Mary. Regarding the Paycheck Protection Program, if we have some employees who are unwilling to return at this time due to fears about the virus, and we are unable to spend the 75% on payroll, will we be required to repay the entire loan? We will be using some of the 75%, but likely not all. 
Right, John, that's, that's one of the things that's changing by the day. Um, there, there are requirements built in for the forgiveness. Not only do you have to spend it for these allowable, um, but you, for the allowable expenses to be forgiven, but you do have to restore your headcount by the end of the eight week period or June 30th. Um, in the last two days, there's been guidance that if you ask people to come back and they refuse to come back because again, it's hard to imagine, but that we all know right now we've got employees that are making more money on unemployment than they were making to work with the $600 federal stipend on top of the state, um, you know, amount. So uh, I think the key, the key on all of this is going to be documentation. Keep your books and records in, you know, impeccable order. Every one of those emails or phone calls you get from somebody refusing to come back, make sure you document it and keep track of it. Because the thought is that you can then make an allocation against the your head count to say these this number of full-time equivalents refuse to come back to work therefore they count as if we put them back into place so uh, it's going to be a different occult and challenging time and certainly we've got there's legislation out there or there's not but there's no legislation but there's lots of discussion about extending this eight-week time frame and but as it's written right now if you fall short of making the payroll uh, getting the payroll numbers up there, there is a chance that the whole loan amount could be refundable. If you fail on all of it, it's still a, a you know, a two-year note at one percent. It's cheaper than anything we're borrowing about, but but we do want to maximize the forgiveness because that's the real power of this. And you do, there are some tripwires in there, so we're going to have to be very careful. But I do have to believe that there's an honest recognition right now that businesses, the eight weeks was thought to be enough, you know. For people to shelter in place and come back and go to work we're seeing it, it very well in certainly areas like dc like certainly here in the new york metropolitan area that that period is extending out much longer than an eight-week period mary any further thoughts on that one yeah i'd like to add too i mean i think when the, the payroll protection program was rolled out you know everybody was running thinking they were going to get a 10 million dollar loan and it was going to be 100 percent forgiven and in crunching through those applications we basically found out that you weren't necessarily getting a $10 million loan. The numbers were less than people had anticipated. And in going through the models, uh, it seems like the same thing is going to apply at the forgiveness level. Um, again, there's complexities probably too long for this time slot we have, but the um, provisions provide for an expected forgiveness, and the expected forgiveness is like we're talking about. If you pay all of the money, all the amount you receive in eligible expenses for payroll, rent, utilities, interest, if you you spend it all on that, there's still a chance you're not getting 100% of the loan forgiven, and that goes into what Jack is alluding to with the the headcounts, right? Because they pick, compare the headcounts to the number of people employed during the eight week period to the number of people in your base period, which could possibly be a 2019 year or a 2020 year. So the fact that there's less head counts in that eight week period is by default gonna reduce the expected forgiveness down to some lesser amount, which they call the reduced forgiveness. And if you go ahead and get any of the loan forgiven, the other dialogue that's been very um, focused on within the last week is that uh, the IRS came out with an interpretation that the eligible expenses paid with forgiven loan funds will not be deductible on your federal tax return. Um, there has been some pushback on that where there's some senators trying to get legislation in place that will remove the IRS's interpretation. Um, but right now, that's the, the guidance that we have. Um, the CARES Act was specific in stating that the forgiven loan would not be taxed as income, but they were silent on whether the expenses paid with that forgiven loan would be deductible. Thank you, Jack and Mary. I do want to add, you know, you live by what you signed at the time of the loan, but just as Mary mentioned, there's a lot of discussion on Capitol Hill on um, extending the eight weeks on um, other provisions of it. So by all means, live by what you were received when you signed, what the rules were, but also make sure you stay alert because it is changing um, on a day-by-day -day basis. And then the way we look at it at the NACA is, 
where are you going to get a 1% loan with an extended period to pay back? So best case scenario, you know, it is a, a forgiven loan. Worst case is that you're paying 1% over an extended period. Um, and believe me, that is a, that is a, a, a good deal on that one. So I don't want anyone to be discouraged if you have the loan or you're applying for the loan or you're waiting to hear the results. This still is a, a game changer, especially in construction, where historically it's been very difficult to get any type of lines of credit uh, or loans for uh, small and new construction businesses. And with that, we'll move on to our next question. And I think we've alluded to it, but is there a list of acceptable expenses that are covered under the Paycheck Protection Program? Yeah, we, we have talked to that. Uh, and But yes, if you just look at the, if, I mean, a simple Google search will give you a listing and we will certainly make it available through to you, John. We'll, we'll give you a list of the, the specific siting of the PPP loans to show, but it's, it's gonna be the, the rent, it's going to be the interest, it's gonna be the mortgage payment, for the interest portion of that, the rent and certain utilities. And then <clears throat> Mary, we can jump back, <clears throat> excuse me, jump down one on the gas. It says, oh, is the gas utility allowed? Yes. Okay. And I think uh, what we've noticed just in our, in our association is even though we're not in the facility, there's still just some you know some automatics that are there whether you use an ounce of electricity or whether you use an ounce of water or or any gas um, there's still a significant portion there of your bill and especially depending on what jurisdiction where there's just a a minimum um, that you have to pay in that utility just for having it um, what about gas for the the work vehicles mary is that also allowed yeah, there's, there's no regulations out yet, or no real interpretations, but the language of the CARES Act in their discussion of utilities, one of the line items is transportation. So the interpretations have been that the gas for the vehicles um, should be included. Okay, thank you. And once, once PPP funds are received, the eight week forgiveness period begins. When this period begins, should I adjust my payroll period to fall within the eight weeks? You know, John, we, my wife has applied for and got funded this week. And, and what I asked the bank to do is not fund until today because that's the start of her pay week. So what I'd rather you try to do is match the funding to your pay week than try and play around with your payroll. Okay, that said, if you've already gotten your funding, for most of your members and most of the smaller contractors, I would not, it technically says it has to be accrued and paid in that period, in that eight week period. So technically, if, if you're bridging the gap, you could pick up a portion of the week. And I don't wanna speak, but what I'm telling you is, get eight weeks worth of payroll in your number. And if you have eight weeks worth, if, if you're staggering a day uh, or not, I don't think it's going to be that critical and I don't think it's going to be that hard, but just make sure you've got the eight solid weeks. If you can line up the date of your funding to match, it makes it very clear. If you really want to be sticklers on it, you can almost do like a layoff check in that last week, you know, in order to cut off on the date of, and you can do it in the beginning. But I just think that's going to be hard, far too difficult to kind of to navigate through. So make sure you track and get eight solid weeks in there and again, control it on the back end on the funding. One thing I wanted to raise, because Mary touched on the issue with, in the insurance, like in the state insurance commissions, there's the opportunity to defer the payments of certain workers' comp and some certain other uh, benefits, like the workers' uh, health health benefit plan. And so, again, in a personal case, we asked for and we were granted the two month extension. Then we got the PPP loan. So we don't want to we don't want to suspend that. We want to go ahead and make those payments in these two in these eight week periods we want to make those two months worth of payments and then we'll see if we can defer on the back end so you know I, i've said this a long and i don't know if i've said it here but you know with this plan they invited us to a baseball game they handed us a football and by the time we have to respond to it we're going to be playing soccer and so it, it's just changing the fields changing the dynamics are changing by the moment and we have to all stay in touch with our with our advisors and stay in touch with our professionals so we track it along the way but 
documentation is going to be key, tracking where and what you use it for. And again, make sure you, you, would, you do it here. And it's not the time, you know, when I started reading that first question, I was gonna say, it's not the time to shift costs or get things into this period, but do make sure that you get every cost that's legitimately expensable in this period into the period of coverage under that PPP loan. Thank you, Jack and Mary. We do have a few questions that were texted to us. We also launched the second poll. So if you can respond to that as well. And I think we've touched on these two is, um, what do you think are the main issues to paycheck uh, protection program forgiveness? I think we mentioned documentation, uh, the time period. Uh, are there any other issues that you think that will you know, that small businesses should be particularly looking out for that may be stumbling blocks. You know, the one thing you have to watch is there's a limit. It's on, of a payroll, it's only up to $100,000. So if you've got a project foreman and she's making $150,000, only 100,000 of her pro prorated wages. So basically it's just under $2,000 a week is the maximum pay that will be allowable for forgiveness. So you have to make sure Paychecks and ADP have done a very good job already of creating internal reports in order to do that maximization for you. So that's one of the areas that you have to pay attention to is, is that highly compensated employee, you know, hers, her compensation, his compensation has to be netted down to, to meet that, um, that cap of the $100,000. And then it's going to be this incurred and paid. So you don't want to take last year's, you know, um, uh, your uh, your profit sharing plan contribution for all of last year and dump it in and pay it in this week in the eight week period here that you're covered under that loan and try and claim that it's just you don't want to get cute companies have to acknowledge there's a real good chance somebody's going to come and audit this thing and you know we lived through it with the you know with all the various programs in the past any of you've done any kind of disaster recovery work it could be years later, hold your documentation forever, you know, for a seven year period and be prepared to support it and do what, what is right and what you guided to under the laws, take full advantage, but don't take excess advantage. This is here to help you. The last thing you want to do is have it look like, you know, you tried to game the system and, and it, that's not a position that, that any of you want to be in. You've worked too hard to get to the position you're in right now. You know, being recognized as a, as a valued partner on these jobs. Yeah, so the other things to watch out for, Jack highlighted those salaries over 100,000, and we also touched upon headcounts, you know, what the headcount would be in the eight-week period compared to the prior periods. But the third thing that also could give you a haircut on the forgiveness is the those employees making under $100,000. If they have experienced a pay cut of more than 25%, that is also going to be a dollar dollar a dollar for dollar reduction in your your loan so um that goes on an employee by employee basis and it's, it's kind of specific to facts but it's something to think about whether you're giving people a pay cut of 20 percent or 25 percent that the 25 percent may hurt you in the forgiveness thank you mary and jack i do uh since many of our participants and people who will watch the webinar video are small businesses uh, who, what type of individuals or backgrounds or professionals do you suggest should be in somebody's circle of advisors or professionals that they, that they hire? Uh, Jack or Mary, could you speak a little bit about that? Sure. I, I see it as, you know, the, the stools that I always talk about is you need an accountant that understands construction. You need an attorney that understands construction maybe two with one litigator and one construction contracts and business side of it. You need to have an insurance agent that understands all the, the specificity of construction contract insurance coverages. You need an surety agent. If maybe it's the same agent that handles both your surety and insurance, but you need somebody that can get you the bonding capacity that you need to grow. And you need a banker that truly is committed to and understands the construction industry. <clears throat> We've seen too much reaction over the years from bankers in the construction space. They're into it, they're out of it. And so you'll want somebody who's there. And then I certainly think that the trade organizations um, locally and then nationally that give you that information, that give you that flow, because they all help to support. None of you smaller contractors can have the access 
that, that a firm like ours has or that you know your group has from this national area. So if you ha have those kinds of affiliations, you have those kinds of people around you that can feed you the information that you're hearing from Washington, D.C., from the state legislature, like one of your you know correspondents came back talking about the local county and municipal grants. That type of information you're going to get from being involved in organizations like this. So for my, you know, for my take, those are the professionals that you want to have as your core team of trusted advisors. Thank you, Jack. Um, I also, last year, uh, Stanford University uh, did a study and they found that businesses that were connected to trade or chamber organizations were more likely to have bank relationships and more likely to get loans. And in the minority community, and especially in construction, um, access to capital and trade accounts is something that affects us uh, disproportionately. So I, I really want to make sure that you get involved with your associations. If it's us, great. If it's another one, the key is to get involved because when the paycheck program went live, our banker called us at seven o'clock in the morning and said, uh, let's apply for this, right? And it was one of the easiest thing. Now this is a banker that we talked to at least twice a week, if not more. So we had a great relationship. We met him again. He was a member of the association and that's how we met him. Um, and so it really helped that someone was being proactive and coming to us and letting us know at seven o'clock in the morning that he was ready to help us with this. And yesterday I was on a call with uh, Speaker of the House Pelosi and she echoed the same thing that um, I had been with her a year and a half ago and she echoed the same thing about small businesses. Um, it's hard to get the attention of these bankers. So if you're not reaching out, if you're just using the ATM and the drive through or online, we have to make that special effort to make sure that we're connected with a banker. I'm not talking about a teller, I'm talking about a banker within the, uh, within the system. We have a few minutes here. I, I do wanna get to see if we can get these questions. Is business insurance covered? Uh, Mary, you mentioned insurances for the PPP forgiveness. Um, no, I don't believe insurances are covered. Okay. Workers' comp probably would be Mary, and you know, so some of the. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, the state unemployment insurance is included. I was thinking in the term utilities, right. but um, like so, for employee benefits, so the health insurance is included, and state unemployment insurance. But your inland marine likely would not be covered as part of this, but the the payroll related insurances would be covered. And again, we're gonna we'll work and try to get a list specific. But I will ask you to stay on top of this um, because there is some changes. There could be some changes. Is the EIDL forgiven or will we have to pay it back? Can it be used for payroll and expenses or just payroll? EIDL loan is going to, is, is a loan and it has a four year term on that loan. It's at, uh, it looks like it's gonna be somewhere between 2.5 and 4% sort of the, the loan amount, uh, the, the rate of interest that we're looking on on that. Uh, it, there was questions as to what the security will be. Parts of it could be unsecured up to 200,000, I think will be unsecured. Above that will be secured loans and there will be repayment. Um, so those, uh, are, those can be, and those are actually are supposed to be used for expenses other than your PPP loan dollar amount. So if you've got one of those, you would use the EIDL for other amounts. So those would be used to cover your suppliers, your subcontractors, your equipment purchases, those types of things. Okay, thank you, Jack. We do contract labor. We are aware that this does not qualify as payroll. What do you recommend for us as subcontractor? Well, contract labor, I mean, if they use contract labor um, and through it like a, a PEO or if they have a, it can qualify. The sub certain 1099 contractors can qualify, but I, I caution everybody to be very careful because if you've been treating them as an independent and they're filing on their own PPLs, you don't want to be picking them up. So, uh, but you have to be very careful on the wording. So some of the contract 
if you're coming out of a, you know, out of a collective um, professional employer organization, those types of costs would go in as your labor costs. If you're doing using day labor type trade, I'd be very careful because you, while you may get some money under this loan, I believe you're going to open yourself up for an audit later on as to whether or not they were truly employees or not. So I'm cautioning everybody in that to think long and hard about this may not be the solution for you in that category. Thank you, Jack. One last question before we close. The pain of increased wages to offset increased costs that COVID has caused, no public transport, having to use personal vehicles to get to job sites, et cetera, is permissible or rebatable, correct? In that eight week period, it will be permissible. Mary, is there a limit on how much of a raise that they can get? Is it 25% as well? Um, I haven't seen anything specifically. I, I would have to look into that to confirm. Okay. But um, I do agree that those would be additional costs that point towards any need of questioning of the loan. But if it is actually put into employee salary, it, it would be eligible. Yeah, if you have to pay time and a half because of conditions, uh, that's going to be part of your payroll base. And in that eight week period, it's going to be forgivable. Thank you, Jack and Mary. We're, it's time to close. We've come to the end. Uh, we will be closing the last poll in a few minutes. So if you haven't answered it, uh, please answer it. As you see, our contact information is will be attached to the PowerPoint. Please read the disclaimer at the front, um, and you'll have a uh, you'll have everyone's contact information. I think this was a really really good. Um, presentation. I know that um, I will just echo what Jack and Mary have said is stay in the safe zone. Um, this is not a time to try to go above the edges. I think that whether it's a forgivable loan or a very low interest with extended pain, those are some good uh, financial tools that's available to you. Um, you don't want to you you don't want to shortchange yourself by doing something that will cost you more in the future. I think these are really really good tools um, that can help us. And with that, if I can invite Jose Suero to close us out and thank our presenters. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Mary Amato and Jack Callahan. We appreciate this today. I know I just saw the poll. It says 100 percent of the people are happy with the information that's been delivered. John, once again, thank you, National Hispanic Construction Association. And Luisa, as always, without you, thank you so much, everybody. This has been wonderful, and I hope we can do this again sometime. Gracias a todo el mundo.